What ought to be included in a given philosophical canon is a contentious question. As academics have rediscovered and reanalyzed various texts throughout history, the traditional canon of Western philosophy has come under intense criticism, for being both exclusionary and intellectually limiting at times. Even the question of what counts as a philosophical text is yet another point of contention in this debate. But for libertarians, the qualifications for being part of the broadly speaking liberal canon I think should be simple and sweet. If a particular person argued for a freer world through individual liberty, voluntary cooperation, and institutional change, they deserve to be remembered for their advocacy. One figure that I believe deserves to be praised both as an example of a person unfazed by overwhelming odds and an advocate for individual liberty is Marie Gournay, the 17th century French woman who became a professional writer despite the hostile attitudes towards women doing any sort of activity outside of the home during her time. Over her long career, she wrote literary criticism, poetry, history, political philosophy, and most controversially for her time, a scathing critique of the laws and cultural mores that kept women oppressed and docile. Today, feminism is a staple of our political lexicon. Regardless of whether one thinks of themselves as a feminist or not, it is undeniable the colossal impact that feminism has had on the world. Before the 20th century, women were relegated to two main roles, being wives and bearing children. Outside of this, there was very little room for material advancement or status from their own efforts. Women's identities and fortunes were intimately tied to their husbands or fathers, who usually had immense control and power over their lives. The patriarchy was rationalized by intellectuals using selective quotations from the Bible and ancient philosophers to support their view that women were naturally, physically, and mentally inferior to men. As Aristotle stated in a quote that many misogynistic thinkers repeat time and time again, the relation of male to female is by nature a relation of superior to inferior and ruler to ruled. Being naturally ruled by the authority of men, women were denied access to education. After all, according to the logic of ancient Greek science, women's anatomy made it impossible for them to think rationally. Giving the irrational an education would provide women with a dangerous tool to turn to their male counterparts. Rhetoric. However, by the 16th century, the world was changing. Columbus had discovered the New World, Copernicus had theorized the sun, not the earth, was the center of the universe, and the printing press had made reading accessible to more people than ever before. On top of all this, the achievements of the Renaissance were in full swing in an artistic sense. As the world dramatically changed for Europeans, both humanists and scholastics alike questioned previous assumptions. In this energetic milieu, Marie Gournay was born on October 6th, 1565, during a golden age of French writing. She was born into a noble family. Her father, Guillaume Le Tars, worked as a treasurer under the French king, Henry III. By the time Marie was three, he had bought the feudal rights to an estate in Picardy under the name Gournay which then became part of his family name, leading to Marie's name, Marie Gournay, even though she was born Marie Lajars. The family split their time between a lavish house in Paris and the Gournay estate. Marie was the oldest of six children. In 1577, by the time the sixth Gournay child was born, Marie's father suddenly died, leaving his wife a widow, unable to afford the upkeep for their Parisian home. She moved back to their family home, Picardy, and their estate. As Marie grew older, her relationship with her mother became increasingly strained. Marie had little interest in learning the traditional household arts expected to be mastered by a lady of her status. She had more interest in a life of study and debate, but her mother saw no reason for her to indulge in her intellectual pursuits. By this time, there had been some female writers, such as the 15th century proto-feminist Christine de Bazin. However, women like her were exceptions, not the rule. But Marie did not listen to her mother. Every hour she had spare, she spent studying and teaching herself Latin by comparing Latin and French texts. Latin is hard to learn with a teacher, but Marie decided to learn it without any outside help or support, a sign of her dedication. Marie had a preference for the ancient Stoic authors such as Seneca and Plutarch, and over time, she would add Spanish and Italian to a repertoire of languages. By the age of 19, she encountered the essays of the philosopher Michel de Montaigne, who stood out at the time for his sceptical attitudes, his free spirit of inquiry, and his intensely personal style of writing, Montaigne was close friends with Etienne de Boétie, the author of A Discourse on Voluntary Servitude, a radical book that attacked the roots of all political authority. Marie herself would later comment that reading Montaigne was a life-altering experience. When Marie learned that Montaigne was in Paris, she immediately wrote to him expressing her admiration, and to her surprise, the next day, Montaigne appeared at her doorstep. Montaigne, then a 55-year-old man, developed a close bond with the young Marie, eventually giving her the title of his adopted daughter, intellectually speaking a title she wore with pride, referring to Montaigne as her second father in turn. 
While this might sound very, very weird, or even a bit creepy, this kind of adoptive arrangement or alliance was actually quite common in intellectual circles in France at the time. Her friendship with Montaigne opened new doors into the world of writing. However, just before Marie could publish her newly inspired work, in 1591, her mother died. Now the oldest of the family, Marie was now charged with securing a living for the remaining members of the family. Marie divided the family estate amongst her brothers and sisters, but she reduced her own portion she received, leading to a lifetime of financial insecurity. Only a year later, tragedy struck again in 1592, when Montaigne died. Marie found it eight months after the event and was devastated by the loss of her second father. In his will, Montaigne named Marie the editor of his new edition of the essays, making Marie Grenet one of the first recorded examples of a female editor in France. Though today Montaigne is deemed one of the most iconoclastic philosophers who ever put pen to paper, Marie's role in acting as Montaigne's intellectual custodian is often forgotten by scholars. She wrote of Montaigne, My father believed that he could teach you nothing better than self-knowledge and practice, now through reason, now through experience. The most instructive advice of all is example, and the finest example in Europe was his life. After her mother's death, Marie travelled to Cambrai, where she was hosted in a governor's house. She might be able to stay there permanently, but she knew her later aspirations could only be pursued close to Paris. In 1594, Marie published her first book, titled Le Promenade de Monsieur Montaigne, a novel inspired by her frequent walks in Montaigne. The story follows a Persian princess, Alinda, who is forced to marry the king of Antioch. While travelling to marry the king, Alinda falls in love with a man named Leontine. After running away together, they are shipwrecked and arrive in Thrace. A Thracian nobleman, Orthaclus, quickly falls for Alinda, while his sister falls in love with Leontine. Alinda learns of Leontin's betrayal and tricks him into killing a servant who had crossed her. Alinda writes a heartfelt farewell letter and takes the place of the servant. Eventually, Leontin realizes he killed the wrong person and takes his own life because of the grief. Marie's novel is arguably one of the first ever French psychological novels. It became extremely popular, being republished in 1595, 1598, 1607, 1626, 1634, and 1641. Though less overt than her other works, Marie uses Alinda's story to illustrate why women need to be educated and not slavishly dependent on their often disloyal partners. A common argument was that educated women would wantonly pursue their desires and abandon Christian virtues like charity and chastity. Marie replied by writing, The vulgar say that in order for a woman to be chaste, she must not be so clever. Truly, it does little to honour chastity to believe that only the blind could find it beautiful. In 1597, she sailed to Brussels and Antwerp, where she was warmly received, an increasing rarity as her life progressed. By the time Marie returned to Paris, she was forced to live within her means, despite her family's former wealth and noble status. She lived with one fiercely loyal servant, Nicole Jamin, and her cats. Fashioning herself as an independent scholar, she began attending the literary salons of Queen Marguerite, conversing with a select group of intellectuals. She wrote poetry about figures such as Joan of Arc and translated ancient authors like Ovid, Tacitus, and Sallust. During the 16th century, translation was a highly esteemed art that Marie took very seriously. She argued that it was not enough just to substitute French words for Latin words. She believed translation required that a translator practice judgment and stylistic taste while keeping as true to the original text as possible. While not an amazingly talented poet, Marie threw herself into debates over her day over what she believed were increasingly arbitrary rules to mean literary tools like metaphors which she defended as the most precious gem in the language of a poem. Marie's detractors often mocked her traditional taste, calling her old-fashioned and out of touch. Though increasingly successful in the literary scene, financial strain plagued Marie's life. So much so, she even resorted to alchemy for a time in attempts to produce gold. Marie found it difficult to fit into high social circles due to her circumstances. But despite her financial situation and her dislike of courtly culture, she successfully made friends in high places and important connections. She was one of the select few women of her period who wrote explicitly about politics. She discussed her views on governments in two works, Instruction of the Prince and Farewell of the Soul of the King. Marie doesn't really challenge the status quo too much of her time. For example, she takes for granted that monarchy is a just institution. But Marie was always careful to specialise the duties of the king rather than his powers. She argued that a good family lineage was not really enough for a good king, and they must be educated to assure virtuous behaviour. Though she had distinguished herself as a scholar and even been awarded a modest pension by the French king Louis XIII, Marie still faced hostility from her male peers. Often she was the butt of cruel insults and practical jokes. In one instance in 1616, she was tricked into writing a book about her life under the impression it was the gift for King James of England. 
When Marie realized she had been tricked, she decided to publish the book anyway. Marie was often quick to lash out at her detractors, and as she said herself, I have a fiery temperament. I hardly ever forget a deeply felt insult. I am impatient and partial to rage. These kind of practical jokes would plague Marie's life until old age, but they only strengthen her resolve to prove the misogynist wrong. In 1641, she would publish her most famous work, The Equality of Men and Women, whereas the title suggests Marie argues for the moral equality of the sexes. While today this is definitely not a unique position, for the time it was a radical and very rare belief, one that challenged the Western philosophical canon. Marie was inspired to write The Equality of Men and Women after reading the absolutely brutally misogynistic Alexis Truset's work, Alphabet at the Imperfection and Wickedness of Women, dedicated to the worst woman in the world. That is the real title and it is a veritable compendium of misogynistic arguments. Alexis does not hide his disgust for women. He calls them the most imperfect creatures in the universe, the scum of nature, the breeding grounds of evil, the source of controversy, the laughing stock of the insane, the scourge of wisdom, the rebrand of hell, the instigator of vice, the cesspool of filth, a monster in nature, and necessary evil. While it might sound like Alexis holds some extreme views, his work was evidently quite popular and was reprinted throughout the 17th century, a testament to the attitudes of the time. However, not all views of women were negative, but they could at times be equally backward. Other authors such as Cornell Agrippa had written treaties on the superiority of women, but these were actually usually more about the skill of the orator than the dignity of women. Bizarre reasons were given for women's superiority as well, such as when a woman drowns she will die face down, not exposing her breasts showing women's apparent dedication to modesty. But for people like Marie, these anecdotes and fanciful tales about the nature of women are ridiculous. Following Aristotle's rule of the golden mean, Marie describes herself as a thinker who flees from all extremities. She explains that, I am content to make women equal to men, nature herself being opposed in this matter as much to superiority as to inferiority. Marie makes her case for equality by constantly quoting from esteemed authorities such as ancient philosophers, church fathers, and passages from the Bible. At first, this might seem quite derivative. Marie is simply selectively choosing quotations to make her case, hardly the work of a genius philosopher. But Marie has her reasons for this particular kind of style. She writes that, Even though women have the powerful arguments of Carnides, there will be some worthless man who will put them down with the approval of those present, when, with just a smile or some little shaking of his head, his mute eloquence would say, It is a woman who speaks. Harsh experience had taught Marie that the vast majority of educated men were not receptive to equality between the sexes. Furthermore, they put no value in the words of a woman. Regardless of her intellect or skill, they would just laugh at her. Thus, Marie decides to argue on the misogynist terms. By referencing the great authorities of the past, she can no longer be dismissed offhand, because it's actually not her who is arguing for equality, but philosophers and saints who form the core belief of the era. If there's a problem, they have to take up with them, not Marie. Marie claims that the only substantial difference between men and women is their respective levels of education, something women cannot properly pursue without ridicule. Marie explains the differences between men and women can be found in their physical strengths and reproductive capacities, however, neither are grounds for discrimination. For example, there are many animals stronger than humans, but this does not mean that elephants are superior to humans because of their size. Marie concludes that physical strength does not justify inequality. In terms of reproductive organs, Marie argues that what makes humans special is not between their legs but between their ears, their brains. She explains that the unique form and difference of this animal consists only in the human soul. Being male or female is an accidental quality, one only necessary for reproduction. Despite their minor differences, in Marie's view, men and women are essentially the same. Both hold a rational soul with a capacity for reason. She jokes about the petty differences of the sexes, explaining, there is nothing that so resembles a male cat on a windowsill as a female cat. To make a case for equality, Marie quotes a wide variety of sources supporting women's equality while also celebrating their historical achievements in philosophy, politics, and writing. She also provides ample evidence referencing biblical stories that women were bestowed the same spiritual dignity God had given to the rest of mankind. Marie's reorganizing of existing historical knowledge into a feminist perspective can arguably be called an early precursor to what people now call, often disparagingly, gender studies. After listing the achievements of women despite the oppression and mockery doled out by men, Marie advocates for women to be educated and have access to public office, just like their male counterparts. Marie's Equality of Men and Women is one of the first publications to actually use the term equality to define the relationship between the sexes. Even in old age, Marie clung to literary hopes, continuing to write about literary criticism and the cause of equality. By the age of 79, she passed away after a long life of writing, 
resulting in her collected works totaling over a thousand pages of poetry, literary criticism, philosophical discussions, and of course, the topic of equality between the sexes. Her work inspired thinkers like François Poulain de la Barre and Anna-Marie van Sherman to argue in similar terms for equality, an idea we often take for granted. Though Marie was actually ultimately successful in styling herself as an independent scholar, one of letters, between the 17th and 19th centuries, her works were nearly entirely forgotten. Besides the occasional reference to her work belittling her old-school literary sensibilities, she kind of fell off the earth for a while. While quite popular in some ways during her life, she was mainly recognised for her work in translation and literary criticism. Her radical arguments for equality were generally ignored by mainstream culture. Thankfully today, scholars are paying more attention to Marie de Gournay. Increasingly, her role in preserving the legacy of Montaigne is appreciated, and her works on feminism have become representative of the finest feminists of the 17th century. Thankfully, unlike Marie's day, the word equality is burned into our collective vocabulary. But it wasn't always this way. And people like Marie Gournay were brave enough to defy societal norms and endure mockery, pushed forward ways of thinking that would change the world. Thanks Mo for listening. Portraits of Liberty is produced by Landry Aries and written by me, Paul Meany. If you like the show, make sure to review us on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you listen to podcasts. If you want to see more content like this, check out the website libertarism.org.